Hello and welcome to U.S. News and World Report. I'm Simon Owens and here with me is Victor Navasky, former editor of The Nation and author of the new book, The Art of Controversy, Political Cartoons and Their Enduring Power. Welcome. Hi, Simon. Good to be with you. Uh, now, one of the things I found interesting reading your book is that though you printed cartoons regularly in The Nation, you didn't really come to fully appreciate their true power until relatively recently, specifically with the riots of the Danish, uh, caused by the Danish Muhammad cartoons. Uh, why did it take you so long to really understand their, their full staying power? I just assumed that um, cartoons gave messages that in a very alive way and in a very condensed way, but it wasn't until my staff showed up in my office, it only happened once in 30 years with a petition demanding that we not publish something in advance, and that something turned out to be a cartoon by the great late David Levine, and it was a cartoon of Henry Kissinger screwing the world, Kissinger on top, the world on bottom in the form of a woman with a globe where her head would have been under an American flag blanket. And uh, the staff had comments like sexist and other things on the side of the petition they handed me. But at the time, I just thought it was an objection to political correctness. And it wasn't until the riots that greeted the Danish Muhammad cartoons, where hundreds of thousands of Muslims took to the streets, that the it became obvious to me that it wasn't just political incorrectness that people were complaining about. It was the fact that it was shown in graphic form and that visual language, which I always knew in theory, had a power of its own, but I never experienced it until then. So I put the two things together and then I got interested and started to research what happened to cartoonists down through the years, starting with Daumier, who got thrown into prison, and, uh, and it goes from there. Well, well, speaking of the, the meeting in the 80s in, you, in your office with the protest, uh, you, you do write a lot about the art of caricature in your book, and one of the things you point out is that caricature, by its very nature, often feeds into stereotypes, even when it's trying to criticize those very stereotypes. And this strikes me as kind of a difficult balance for the artist. Do you think this is why many cartoonists are so misunderstood? Well, I think that's a great question, and I think the question of where you draw the line between reinforcing a stereotype or building on a stereotype to make a comment is uh, at the heart of, of one of the reasons that cartoons have the power they do, but also caricatures are something else again, because caricatures are by definition unfair, they are exaggerations, and if you don't like an editorial in a newspaper or an article, you can write a letter to the editor complaining about it, even if it's only in your own head. But if you don't like a caricature, especially if it's of you or someone that you identify with, there is no such thing as a caricature to the editor. You feel impotent to answer it. And I think that's one of the reasons that cartoons have the power that they do, and especially caricatures. And, and one of the, the best examples you have is the recent, or somewhat recent, New Yorker cover in 2008 of uh, Obama and Michelle, and uh, that's a caricature that was in some ways so well done that people didn't even recognize it as a caricature. Well, I think there, and there you get into a satirical comment, and people, uh, it showed Obama in, in Muslim garb and Michelle in terrorist garb when she was carrying a rifle, and there was a picture of of Osama bin Laden on the wall, and what the cartoonist thought he was doing, Barry Blitt, was satirizing people who thought that the Obamas were Muslims and terrorists. In fact, the, the cartoonists were satirizing peop the people who had those ideas, but the readers felt that he was claiming that Obama <laughs> the Obamas were terrorists. So there was that misunderstanding. But again, I think it gained in power because of the visual the visual images that speak to people through their brains in a different way than words do. And there's a section in The Art of Controversy about neuroscience because there's a whole new field called neuroaesthetics, which looks at cartoons and caricatures as um, the stimulus and what happens in the brain as the response. And, and you pointed out, though, uh, specifically with this New Yorker cartoon, the, 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 most of the outrage came from people who weren't actual subscribers of the New Yorker. So it, it seems that um, 
and that the people who do subscribe to the New Yorker, they, they got the joke. Um, it, I guess I wonder what that means about how, how messages are conveyed in cartoons and whether it's very easy to misunderstand one. Well, some are misunderstood. I mean, and but the New Yorker readers are particularly sophisticated. Although Art Spiegelman has run into trouble a number of times with his New Yorker covers, one a famous one on St. Valentine's Day, which I have in the book, in which it shows a Hasid kissing a Caribbean woman, and Hasids are no, not supposed to kiss women who aren't their wives, and uh, it caused an outrage including among New Yorker readers, and Tina Brown, who was the editor at the time, saw it coming and had him write an explanation in advance that was in the magazine on which the cover appeared it called the St. Valentine's Day Kiss, but it didn't help. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering what, you, what your thoughts are, what has more staying power? Uh, what leaves more of a legacy, the cartoon or the written word? Well, I think, you know, it, it varies case by case, but um, the most powerful cartoons of one sort you never forget. For example, anyone who saw the Lyndon Johnson, David Levine's Lyndon Johnson showing his appendectomy scar in the shape of Vietnam, that is an indelible image that people won't forget. Going all the way back to Daumier when Louis Philippe was the, was the king, who, he's the king who threw Daumier into prison, uh, Daumier and his publisher, Philippon, both did caricatures of Louis Philippe as a pair, a pair, and he became known as Le Poire, which also means fathead in French. And uh, the people who saw that started calling him Le Poire and forever after thought of him in terms of the caricature of a pair. Well, you, you, you kind of seem to theorize that cartoons draw more, more, much more deeply in terms of the wounds that they leave. Uh, and that politicians have often reacted much more viciously against cartoons criticizing them than op-eds. Well, I think it goes back to one of America's most famous and most talented cartoonists, Thomas Nash, who uh, gave the Republicans their elephant and gave the Democrats their donkey. And he did these cartoons of Boss Tweed. And Boss Tweed famously said at one point, I don't care what they say about me but get rid of those damn pictures. My constituents can't read, but they all see those damn pictures. <laughs> and it, kind of going back to the idea of stereotypes that we were talking about before, there have been many cartoons published that history has judged pretty harshly, especially in the World War II era. Um, do you think that's, a, that's something that, where it's very easy to, to cross over into something that's truly politically incorrect? Well, it's, I think it's more than political incorrectness, because even if you go back to World War I, when The Masses was publishing, Art Young was uh, a great cartoonist who did things regularly for The Masses, and Robert Minor was a great cartoonist who did them. Art Young did a wanted poster, Jesus Christ Wanted for Sedition and Vagrancy, and the government attempted to shut the masses down, they succeeded in doing so eventually under the Espionage Act, accusing them of conspiring to undermine the war effort. And uh, I wonder, lastly, if you could ruminate a, a bit on where political cartoons are heading. There's been a lot of talk about how newspapers have been dropping a lot of political cartoons. Do you think this profession has a viable future? Well, I, it's become a convention to and a cliche to say that cartoonists are endangered species. But the fact is that with even the talk we're having now with all of the new apps and all of the new technology and all of the new iPads and all of the new opportunities for visual representation, I think cartoonists not only are here to stay, but they're going to be more powerful than ever. And every time a new medium is invented, McLuhan taught us this, People think the old medium is going to go out of business when they invented radio. They thought printing would go out of business when they invented printing. People thought conversation would go out of business when they invented movies. People thought radio would go out of business when they invented television. People thought movies would go out of business. But the new inventions become add-ons with a power of their own, and the old media still stay, and they interact with each other. I think that's going to happen with the new media and cartoons as well. 
Well, Victor, I really enjoyed reading your book. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, it was my pleasure to talk to you, Simon.